Happy weekend, everybody. Thank you for joining us with what we are calling the Harambe Talks. Uh, and today, Harambe Talks to Will Travers, who is a legendary conservationist and has been fighting for, for uh, his, pretty much his whole life to stop this captivity and stop this abuse of animals worldwide. And he is the president of the Born Free Foundation. Now, if you're not familiar with the Born Free Foundation, we highly encourage you to go to their website and check it out because there is a massive, massive issue with animals that are being kept in captivity. And the name Born Free says it all. It's actually the solution to all of the suffering that these animals face. It's, it's one concept that creates the future path. And it's, it's a way that we have to reframe our thinking and talk about it. So we're very excited to have Will on today. He's been very busy and is excited that he could take some time today, meet with us and talk to us about Harambe because it's such an important story. And the more we see more press coming out, the more we see more people discussing what's happening and, and the zoos, we're finding that people have a very, um, a, a very, almost a blind trust in zoos to educate, to keep the animals safe and to keep the guests safe and to do what is considered the best animal welfare. Um, although we don't always know the cases, we know that the majority of the time that is not the case itself. And uh, today we wanted to talk about one of the really important things in Harambe movie is to discuss zucosis. Now, zucosis was a word that comes from the Born Free Foundation. So uh, really quickly, um, we are going to, we don't want to waste any more time. We're going to bring Will right on and let's start talking about these topics. Let's start talking about captivity, how zoos can, can help or not help and what is the future for animals in captivity? So here we go. Thank you, Will, for being on today with us. Oh, it's a great pleasure, Eric. How nice to see you again. Great, yeah, great to see you again. It's, it's been, it's been a, a little while. We, we did our first interview for the Harambe movie about uh, two years ago. It was, it was a couple of years ago. And, and the world has changed, not always for the better, but uh, the world is um, is still as troubled a place as it was then, to slightly different challenges, but um, nonetheless desperately important. And the natural world, uh, which I know we're both fascinated by and committed to, is, is in real trouble. And it seems like some of the sort of short-term agendas of those that we elect or uh, our, our leaders uh, seem to be taking precedence over the long-term survival of the the natural world and indeed the planet, which includes ourselves. So we really are up against it at the moment. So we need to do all we can. Your work uh, for the, the last many, many years has been to make sure that everybody keeps talking about what's happening to animals in captivity. Uh, <laughs> so this is a perfect perfect opportunity to share with everybody that we have on today and discuss that a little bit. Um, first of all, if, for people that aren't familiar with the Born Free Foundation, if you can just kind of tell us about what you guys do. So the, as the name might suggest, those of you with long memories uh, may remember a film called Born Free. Well, books called Born Free by the famous Joy Adamson, and then a film called Born Free that came out in 1966. And uh, that film starred a, a number of lions, but it also starred my mum and dad, Virginia McKenna and Bill Travers, my late father. And um, it was the beginning of our family's fascination with wildlife. Um, the next big step was working with an elephant in a film called An Elephant Called Slowly, a little wild caught elephant that had been caught by the Kenya government of the day as a gift to London Zoo. And after filming, after waylaying her for about six weeks, she was, despite our, our, our best efforts, she was sent to London Zoo where in 1983, she was euthanized um, at the age of 17. And um, she looked like a, a husk of an elephant. She was, uh, her skin was dry, her tusks were both, one was completely gone, one was uh, broken in half. Uh, she dis displayed stereotypic behavior, which we now uh, more broadly describe as zoocosis. And, um, uh, they tried to move her to another zoo and the move failed. Anyway, long story short, she died. And we wondered at that time who was looking at what was going on in zoos because there is a kind of received wisdom. Zoos have been around 
for a very long time, even in their modern form. In London Zoo, the 1820s, London Zoo was established in its modern form. And so it, it sort of handed down from one generation to the next that zoos are a, quote, good thing. Um, why would you go on a Saturday afternoon and take your kids to a bad thing? You, you know, it's, it's counterintuitive. So they must be good. And we questioned that. So we said, is it really all it's cracked up to be? Looking at the claims uh, around conservation, around education, around research, and our continuing research now for 40 years um, indicates to us very strongly that uh, zoos have broadly failed in their three objectives, to educate, to carry out research, and to conserve. Of course, Anyone watching this will go, oh, yeah, but I know a zoo where they keep the, make it up, lions very well. Or I know a zoo that puts some money into the conservation of gorillas or something. And and yes, there are. But there are something in the order of 10,000 zoos around the world. Uh, they spend billions of dollars, billions of dollars every year. And this is at a time where we're in a biodiversity crisis and we are, the natural world is crying out for the scale of investment necessary to turn the tide, to, to slow the decline, halt the decline, and reverse the decline in biodiversity. And I would argue that uh, zoos play no more than a bit part in that great drama, and that we have to find better ways of supporting nature than to... Um, have animals incarcerated in 10,000 institutions around the world using uh, billions of dollars every year just to, to tick over when we really need to be investing in nature and the wild and to reverse the decline in biodiversity. Zoocosis. This was a word invented by my husband, Bill Travers. He was completely dedicated to examine the conditions of wild creatures in captivity. And he traveled to various zoos recording the captive uh, situations of the wild creatures. Zoocosis was invented by him to describe the abnormal behavior of animals in zoos. Animals in captivity displayed stereotypic behavior, abnormal behavior, a psychosis of some kind. And he created this name, this word, which to me sums it up to perfection, because I've seen in my life, as Will has and so many of us have, many, many examples of wild creatures kept in confinement, which they cannot really tolerate. They, it does drive them crazy. So these breeding programs, um, first of all, do they help the wild? And what, what do you find to be their intent and purpose? Yeah, I mean, there are breeding programs. There are coordinated breeding programs that zoos collaboratively and cooperatively engage in for a very limited number of species. Um, there was a, a famous um, zoologist called Ulysses Seal who worked for the uh, IUCN's Reintroduction Specialist Group. And um, his estimate, not my estimate, was that if you took all the space in all the zoos the, all the federated zoos, I should say, not not the, the, the roadside menageries, but all the zoos that belong to either the European Association of Zoos and Aquaria or the British and Irish Association of Zoos and Aquaria or the AZA or any of these federated organizations. If you took all the space in those zoos and devoted it to cooperative breeding of threatened species, you could probably, probably, uh, look after 500 species. Well, there are 33,000 species of plant and animal that are threatened by international trade and are listed on the CITES, the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species of Wild Fauna and Flora appendices. So with the best will in the world and being as generous as I can be, and, and I try to be generous, um, I don't think zoos touch the sides of the issues. There will be some entities that stand head and shoulders above others that are doing not just a bit more, but a lot more. But they are in a tiny, tiny, tiny minority. And so if you regard 
zoos as a big experiment. That's how I like to describe it. If you say there's this big experiment uh, that's been going on for nearly 200 years, uh, which involves keeping species in captivity, breeding them in captivity, potentially returning them to the wild to reinforce wild populations or repopulate areas that have lost that particular species. And through that process, we will invite the public to attend. And, and there are 600 odd million zoo visits a year. So a, a lot of people go to zoos. You would have thought that that combined effort would have generated an enormous groundswell of conservationists and activists and people, uh, you know, dedicated to the protection of the natural world and to wild species. And I have to say, I can I cannot find a correlation between all those people going to zoos and all that money being spent on uh, animals in captivity and the captive breeding program. I can't find a correlation between that effort and the end result that we seek, which is to protect the natural world, which is still in free fall, quite frankly, um, around around the planet. Um, and real quick, the breeding thing, you know, we were noticing with gorillas that they only seem to breed Western lowland gorillas. Um, whereas if they really were concerned, there are other gorillas whose numbers are way lower than the Western lowland gorillas. Um, and we never hear about them from the zoos. We don't hear about them in our education uh, at the zoos. Well, I should say the education, uh, because as you mentioned, with over 600 million zoo visits a year, people have not taken up that mantle and said, let's save these. You know, they, it, it feels like it's not working. This idea of the ambassadorship is not inspiring people uh, in the way that the zoos portray that they're trying to inspire people. Um do you think that uh, that you know that the ambassadorship uh, is working, or do you think that it's even needed in order to help save animals? Um, I I don't I don't think that it's a, a sort of functional model. What I will say is, for example, um, if I take um, the Aspinall zoos, there are two zoos in the United Kingdom run by Damien Aspinall um, in conjunction with the Aspinall Foundation, and you, you mentioned Western lowland gorillas. I don't, I'm not aware of, frankly, anybody uh, breeding Eastern lowland gorilla, which is the uh, one of the three gorilla species, the one that is in most peril because its decline is faster than any of the other two. In fact, the mountain gorilla numbers are, with a huge amount of effort, all in the wild effort, are creeping up. Western lowland gorilla still numbers significant numbers of animals, but the eastern lowland gorilla, the grass gorilla, is in massive trouble uh, in the eastern part of the Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, Damien Aspinall has successfully bred gorillas in captivity and has successfully returned more gorillas to the wild than all other zoos put together. And his mission, as I understand it to be, and this is in the published literature, is that he wants to go out of business. He wants. He does not think that the zoo model um, is truly effective. So his whole effort is is pivoting towards uh, rewilding animals and then putting his time, his effort and his money into conserving and protecting species in their natural habitat. Um, to think that, you know, in a, in a zoo, you might have um, a few elephants, you might have a few tigers, you might have a few lions, you might have a few gorillas, and that somehow those the suffering of those individual animals, and you know, no doubt that in 99% of cases, those animals are suffering in captivity. They are deprived of their natural social structures. They're deprived of their natural environment. They, are, they live their lives according to the regime that we impose on them. So for example, an elephant might be let out into the outside yard um, at say eight in the morning, and if you're in the United Kingdom it, in winter, it gets dark at uh, 3.30, 4 in the afternoon, the elephant will be back in. That means that elephant is inside an elephant house for 16 hours every single day during the winter. Um, we have inclement weather. We have sub-zero temperatures. Um, and to say that, that suffer the suffering of that animal, because it's an ambassador for its species, is acceptable 
is to me unacceptable, is, is completely wrong. And while maybe 50 years ago or more, some people in the zoo world could have made a case to say, yes, but look, how are people, urban people, in our increasingly urbanized society going to sort of engage with the issues? I mean, if, if I think back that long, and I'm 64, when I was a child, there was um, there were two, no, wait a minute, there were three terrestrial television channels in the United Kingdom. That was it. Then there was a fourth. And now, of course, with uh, satellite and uh, and streaming services and everything else, we have hundreds. Um, it does mean, of course, that the audiences for each show tend to be an awful lot smaller. But we have we have the internet, we have virtual reality, we have augmented reality, we have so many different platforms and ways to better understand and engage with the natural world in our urban society um, than we did. 50 years ago, the zoo option has dramatically diminished, in my opinion, dramatically diminished in its significance. Is uh, that's uh, you know there has been so so much change, and it is amazing to see an international community starting to to click and connect. Um, you know, and and it seems that people want to see rewilding. They want to see us go back to nature. You know, it feels like at least. You hear a lot of people talking about, oh, you know, I, I wish I could go back to the day when there weren't cars, you know, uh, where we could just walk to the village, <laughs> you know. Um, so there's something inside of us that connects with nature, and it has been somewhat um, chopped off from our instinct being surrounded by concrete and, and walls for so long. Uh, but it's still inside of us, and, um, and, and that to me is an indication that every animal, even born in zoos, uh, has that and knows that they're supposed to be somewhere else. Um, that they're, yeah, that, that, they're, that may well be that may well be true. And and I think that we've also got uh, Eric to to um, try and wean ourselves off the idea that the only wildlife that matters is is sort of exotic wildlife that lives on the other side of the planet. Of course, that matters, and of course, we need to put time, effort, and resources into assisting the countries where those species live in protecting those species and protecting those habitats, increasing the size of habitats, despite the growth in human populations, all of those real life challenges that conservationists face each and every day. But we must also remember that we have opportunities to engage with wildlife right on our doorstep. You know, even if you live in a tower block, there's almost certainly a park five minutes away there's some green space five minutes away. If you go to a school and there's a little small patch of land there that could have trees, that could have um, be planted for um, insects and for pollinators, then we can do something about it really close to home. Um, so it, it's important that we don't segment nature into the nature we want to save and the nature that we really don't care about and, and that can be destroyed. We need it. We need it all. Um, and we need it all now. Um, I was talking to someone the other day and uh, they said, you know, do is there hope? And I said, um, if you ask me that question in 10 years time and we haven't taken the actions necessary to address the climate change crisis, the biodiversity crisis, then I, in 10 years time, I'll say there is no hope right now. This is our window of opportunity. And, and, you know, to bring it back to our subject, I don't think that zoos are stepping up to the mark to make the substantive difference in the immediate time frame that is absolutely essential as we stand here in 2023. Uh, you know, there are really practical issues here. So I, I have not been a fan of zoos throughout my entire professional life. Um, you know, I would like to see the humane phasing out of, of zoos, and I would like to see our time, effort, and resources put into conserving and protecting wildlife in the wild. But there are practical implications to that. What about uh, the animals that are in zoos now that can't go back to the wild? You know, what happens to them? So the establishment of, uh, of sanctuaries, of effectively sort of retirement homes for 
uh, wild animals that have no future except in captivity is very important. Born, born free is involved in uh, several sanctuaries and rescue centers, one in Ethiopia, which not only looks after the animals, but also effectively assists in the wildlife law enforcement that's carried out by our partners at the Ethiopian Wildlife Conservation Authority. I mean, if you're an officer and you uncover someone who's smuggling cheetah cubs out of the Horn of Africa, through Ethiopia, out of the Horn of Africa, into the Middle East as uh, status symbol pets, but there's nowhere for you to put them if you step in and intervene and confiscate, you're going to be, you know, think twice before you take action. What do I do with these animals? By having the only wild animal rescue center in Ethiopia, we actually perform a function not just for the animals involved, but for the wildlife law enforcement agencies that are trying to do their job. Um, so we need to think about sanctuaries and the role that they can play, can play and how they are different from zoos. You know, they're not about buying and selling animals. They're not about um, uh, breeding animals because you don't want to set up a sanctuary but continue breeding and then you end up being full in three years and now you can't take any more animals that need rescue. There's all sorts of permutations that we need to consider. But, but I think one of the things that I've been fascinated by recently has been the um, frustration that I sense amongst young people you know, and, and I was listening to a, a friend of mine, a British naturalist called Chris Packham, talking the other day about his profound, almost despair. I, I don't want to put it too strongly, but he said, you know, I have been an observer of the destruction and decline of the very thing that I love and that I've spent my life uh, trying to protect. And he feels... I think it's not too strong to say. I think he feels a failure. And I, and I, you know, I share that. I, as I said, I've been doing this for 40 years. And I guess the best that I could claim is that things might have got worse a little more slowly, but not necessarily stopped or got better because of the effort that not just, of course, just not me, but so many people have put in. And I think that that's that tipping point, that I understand why young people, for example, feel desperately frustrated that mm -hmm. they look out, they look at their TV or look at their tablet or their smartphone, or they listen to their elected leaders, they're, they're probably too young to vote. And, and all they see is this devastation that's going on, uh, climate change, extreme weather events, um, the increase in the inequality between those who have and those who have not, um, the crisis that's going to face us when it comes to water, to food, to the distribu distribution of, of food, the encroachment of human societies into marginal land that 30 years ago we'd have said quite clearly, well, no, th there's no point in trying to farm on that land because it's going to be in a cycle of drought every three years perhaps now every two years, and our crops will fail. But now we're, we're even going into those areas because we have kind of run out of road. And of course, what does that mean for wildlife? It means that the wildlife estate, the land on which wildlife lives and must rely on, is getting increasingly put under pressure. There, there is some interesting and I think good news um, in Kenya, for example, um, the, there is an entity called the Northern Rangelands Trust. And the NRT is a kind of umbrella organization for local communities who want to live with wildlife, who have historically lived with wildlife, who want to uh, benefit not by killing wildlife, but by having wildlife on their land, which does good things for their ecology, but also opens up the opportunity for, for tourism and revenue generation in those areas. And the NRT now manages collaboratively an area of land bigger than all the national parks and national reserves in Kenya put together. So someone said to me the other day, is the, you know, is the problem that the amount of land available for wildlife is going down? And I said, in, in general, that probably is true. But there are some good examples of where a different way of thinking is bringing more land back for wildlife, not reducing it. 
and you know, I, I think um, like you're talking about, you know, there's, it's, it's almost like there's this short term goal of how do we save the animals right now that are suffering? And then there's the long term goal of how do we change our perception and our thinking and our relationship to the natural world for a long term solution uh, as well. And I love that because you guys have really focused on that, I think, with Born Free, you know, not just practical solutions, which you guys are always pushing and promoting and helping animals every day, but also how do we how do we think differently? And, and again, it goes back to the born free idea, you know, um, because, it, you know, thinking about Harambe, we hear a lot of the, you know, oh, the mother was responsible, oh, the zoo, you know, the, the, the thing is, is that the only way to have prevented that tragedy was if he would have been born free. And it really does come down to that. So I think there is a, a beautiful seed just even the name of of your foundation um, puts in people's minds. Um, yeah, and, and I think and you what, know, are, that's what are the values that we um, what are the values that we value most? Um, I think mm. you know you're right. The only way that the Harambe tragedy could not have happened had there not been a zoo with Harambe. I mean, that would have made. 100% sure that that tragedy never occurred. Otherwise, it was a combination of misunderstandings and maybe safety issues and all sorts of different factors that came into play that opened up the opportunity for the tragedy to happen that, that indeed did happen in, in the end. Um, but I think that if we think about our values and then try to create the society that we want to see based on those values. Um, I, uh, I believe that the two strongest values of all are love and freedom. And if you think about how we, how we articulate our desire for freedom, we have the Statue of Liberty. We have uh, in France, the motto is... Um, Liberté, fraternité, égalité, liberté. We think about freedom, uh, the freedom to choose, the freedom to choose our own path. Of course, society must build some rules around it, but freedom is incredibly important. Freedom to love whom we want to love. Freedom to do what we want to do. Freedom to go where we want to go. And, and, uh, and with that comes enormous responsibility. And, and I think part of that responsibility is to express our freedoms in a way that does no harm. So I, I want to nail the um, idea, and this may not necessarily be something that your uh, listeners um, agree with, but for me, the freedom to go and kill an animal for fun is not a, is not a freedom that I confer. It's not a freedom that we should um, tolerate. Um, taking away a life is taking away that, uh, that animal's freedom. And my choice to go and see that animal has now been eradicated as well. So I think that uh, freedom comes with huge responsibilities. Love comes with huge responsibilities. But those values should underpin every single thing that we do. And kindness and compassion cannot be measured. They should be unconditional. Beautifully said. Beautifully said. Um, I just want to, real quick, uh, we have a couple people joining us. Uh, I just want to say hi to. I see that uh, we have uh, Pamela. Hey, Pamela, thank you for joining. Uh, Julie is a, a friend of ours who's actually working to try to get Lucy out of the uh, Edmonton Zoo and has been uh, working tirelessly to try to bring more attention to that story and to try to help, um, help the, uh, Lucy be moved out of freezing conditions in Canada. Julie has shown us some, some images and some videos of, of Lucy in snow, you know, uh, snow conditions, uh, incredibly cruel area, um, which I also want to get into the zoo concept of um, selling off this torture art, as some people call it. Um, Mike Waller's uh, joining as well. He's an um, uh, amazing uh, water rights activist. Um, and he says the natural, the health of the natural world is what really matters because we have encapsulated so much of the Earth's surface, and that puts a pinch on our health as humans and the planet itself. Uh, 
It does. Um, and, you, know, you know, Mike's right. The, the um, you know, in uh, because of the pandemic in lockdown, I think people, many, many people all over the world realize just how important um, sort of access to nature is for their mental well-being. Um, and maybe because planes weren't constantly flying overhead uh, and we weren't caught up in the race to get to work and then the race to get home from work um, and missed out on life in the meantime, we appreciated that context with nature. And um, uh, and Julie, I just want to say, you know, keep going, because I remember the story of Maggie, I think it was the elephant um, in Alaska, the only elephant in Alaska in a shopping mall. And it took years of campaigning for her to be eventually brought to the, um, the pause sanctuary in California, which I've been fortunate enough to visit. And uh, it, what that story tells me is firstly, you have to be relentless and you have to, you know, never give up, never give in. Um, at the same time, that thing I said earlier, you have to have somewhere for that animal to go that is a massive improvement uh, on his or her quality of life. And the work that Ed Stewart and Chris Draper and others do at the Poor Sanctuary in California is quite remarkable and gives those elephants a second chance uh, of a life worth living. And I think that that's vital. <laughs> And that's and, and you know you guys have had a, a lot of experience and, and the good thing is you've seen a lot of victories. I know that you have you're always you know cataloging what's happening in the zoos in captivity worldwide, um, U.S., uh, U.K., but even beyond. You know as you were mentioning uh, Africa and other areas where you guys are working. So you always have your kind of your your finger on the pulse of how our wildlife is doing and how our world is doing. And um, I know that that. That must be a bit overwhelming um, sometimes, you know, working in the field, you you lose a little bit of your, your soul sometimes when you see these things. But yeah, but you know, you're right. The, the, the victories are always hard won. But when you get a victory, it gives you the energy and it gives you the, the gas in the tank to move on to the next victory, however hard that is. So uh, I'll give you just a couple of examples, three examples. The first one is that I... I um, started working on captive dolphins in the UK in the late 1980s. And by 1992, the end of 92, beginning of 93, there were no more captive dolphins in dolphin area in the UK. Um, we were involved um, in a team that took three of the last dolphins to the Caribbean and ultimately released them successfully into the wild. And there have been no dolphins in captivity in the UK now since 1992. And someone who's got better maths than me will tell me that's over 30 years. And there's no appetite for it either. You know, there's not there's not a, a you know a screaming horde outside of our Department for Environment saying why aren't we allowed to have dolphins back in the UK? There just isn't. Um, the second one is something very recent, really, in the United States. The, um, the publicity that was generated ar around Tiger King um, opened a lot of people's eyes to the sort of showmanship, roadside menagerie, private ownership of big cats in this instance. And the introduction and the signing into law of the Big Cat Public Safety Act by President Biden um, only what is it eight months ago nine months ago um, is a is a massive step forward in my view uh, we actually helped draft the original text for that in 2008 or something like that so again took a long time to get it over the line but that's a that gives you energy and and now of course we're focusing in the states on things like uh, the primate safety act which would, prohibit the private ownership of primates, which can be, have catastrophic outcomes, both for the animals, but also for people as well. And then my final example is, I, I think it was 1994, I started working on a, a government um, committee in the United Kingdom 
um, which lasted for three years, looking at wild animals in circuses. And then they reconvened the committee in 2005, six, and we'd worked for another two years and it could did not gain the political traction necessary. But just a few years ago, the government passed into law a ban on the use of wild animals in circuses in the United Kingdom. And now we have none. Um, and hooray, it, it, it wasn't a lot of animals that were involved, but the principle behind it and the signal that it sends to other countries and other campaigning organizations and to individuals who, who really want to make a change is, as I said before, don't give up, don't give in, because I think we are on the right side of history when it comes to these kind of issues. And the tide is flowing in one particular direction. And we have younger generations coming along who are eager and urgently want these changes to take place. What we have to do is to help create the circumstances, the, the environment in which those changes can happen and then shift our emphasis, effort, energy to stabilizing our fragile planet and our fragile natural world um, for future generations. I, I have a, you know, I have kids. I have, you know, I, I do talk to them about these things and, and they're very supportive, but I can imagine how many people are so disillusioned with what they see when they open the paper or uh, watch something on their, their screen, however big or small. The, the, and that, that's exactly it. You know, we, we need to, the next generation does seem very passionate. Uh, you know, it, it's fantastic. I was actually just on an elephant rescue uh, recently. And with us was uh, one of the people working on it had brought their 12 year old daughter who had been to Taiji and has also worked in several animal rescue um, things. And so she's kind of growing up with the, with that as a normalcy. You know, when I grew up in America, anything eco-based was not normal at all. We, we had Earth Day and that was one day, but, you know, and anybody that talked about the environment was kind of really pushed to the side. Yeah. And, and it feels like the tide has definitely changed and things are, are, are headed in the right direction that way. <laughs> uh, and I think you're right. I mean, I'm, I'm huge. Um, so you've got a, you've got a few messages there. I just wanted to say, Eric, that my, my dear mum, who helped found the organization 40 years ago is still, is still going strong and she's 92 and the youngest member of our board is 20. Um, uh, Bella Lack, an environmentalist, a campaigner, spoken at the uh, climate summits and is an a outspoken voice for, for change. So uh, by what I'm really saying is bring young people into the process. Don't regard them as an external voice that sort of just prods your conscience once in a while. Bring them in. Make the decisions that we are taking today partly their decisions because they will then own the journey forwards. I see something from Cam yes. Camilla Millie. Oh, there's, there's Camilla. Let's see, Camilla says, we have to stop thinking of animals as ours to use, whether it's entertainment, pushing animals beyond their limits in sport, clothing, medicine, food, and every other way. All zoos now are making money source, uh, making money making sources. We need to let all animals live their lives for themselves. Humans take and take until there's literally nothing left. When will we learn? It's a very good question, Camilla. <laughs> um, you know, it, and but you know, I think she makes a great point in that. You know, uh, the, the animals should have their animal lives. You know, like Ian Ian Redmond had said. You know, the, the gorillas are gorilla beings. We're human beings. You know, we have separate paths, you know, they're not interested in running down to the mall and grabbing some shoes, you know, they, and we have to allow their, you know, their, their what they want to do, um, you know, eat some leaves or, or do their thing, you know, uh, and, and uh, it's amazing to me, like, um, you know, it, a lot of, we see a lot of times people will just leave nature alone. And when we do, nature heals itself and starts to bring itself back. Uh, little by little. Um, I know, you know, we, we see a lot of hope stories from when COVID happened and people stopped being, you know, so much in nature and there weren't quite as many cars on the road. And there was a lot of things where our civilization imprint or footprint was a little lessened um, by that. But also 
COVID, I know you guys uh, made a great video um, and I encourage everybody to go to the website and watch it about understanding being caged up because COVID made us all go stir crazy and, and a little bit cabin fever, you know, um, because we wanted to get out of there. And for people to take that one step further and imagine that you're born that way and you'll never get to leave the room that you're in. That is what uh, the majority of the animals in captivity face day to day. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very true. Some really great points being made in the in the comments. So um, thank you to to everyone who's who's making comments, Julie and Camilla and and Mike and others. Um, yeah, I, I think that um, th there is a misconception. I, I mean, I'm not an evil. I'm not even. I don't have a degree. I never went to university. Um, so I, I sort of I'm more like a naturalist than than an academic. But I was reminded recently that we many people have a misinterpretation of evolution. They think evolution is shaped like a pyramid and that there are mm. lots of less uh, evolved creatures at the bottom and right at the top. It's us. And and I don't really see it like that. I think it's like a flat tree. All species on living on the planet right now are as evolved as they can be. We are all equally evolved. That doesn't mean we have the same capabilities, the same capacities, but we are equally evolved. And as the most, um, as the species that has the most ability to influence and change the lives of other species, we should always ask ourselves the question, just because we can, should we? We can do anything. I mean, we can literally obliterate not just the natural world. We can obliterate ourselves. We have enough weapons to wipe out humanity in 24 hours, if, if that's the craziness that we want to subscribe to. But we also have extraordinary capacity to do good things. There was a, a wonderful quote from Audrey Hepburn, um, who um, I was very fortunate enough to meet once for, for tea. And I couldn't believe it. I went into a room and there was a cup of tea and five people and she was one of them. And she's quoted as saying, and, and, and I believe it's true, and if it isn't true, I want it to be true, that she discovered why you have two hands. One hand is to help yourself, and the other hand is to help others. And I think that is mm. that is a, a mental attitude. It's a state of mind that we should embrace because that is the only way we are all going to get through this. You know, I don't mean, you know, me forever. Um, I'll be gone in 20 years' time probably. But if we are all going to get through this for the long term, then we need to help each other and help ourselves. And at the moment, there's a little bit too much just helping ourselves as a, at a point that was made in the chat. That, that's a really beautiful analogy, you know? And yeah, I mean, I guess right now, exactly. It's it's more like we're, people are more like the crabs that have the little arm and then the giant arm. <laughs> uh, we, we need to have uh, some, some, you know, the same, <laughs> same use uh, with mm. both. Um, that's a really beautiful, um, Beautiful way to see it. Uh, I've never heard it said that way. So, um, and, 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 and I'll use one more analogy, Eric. Uh, um, and this is one you've heard, I'm sure, and many others have. But I use it a lot because I think it is. People often say it's just little me. You know, it's just little Will. And what can I do? How can I make any difference whatsoever? And I, and I retell the story of the two. I think they were Chinese gentlemen walking down a beach. And the beach is scattered with starfish and one of them reaches down and picks up a starfish from the sand and tosses it back into the water and then reaches down and picks up another and his friend turns to him and he says you know my friend the, the beach is littered with starfish what difference does it make and the first man reaches down and picks up another starfish and tosses it back in the water and says it made a difference for that one and then another and then another so i think we can we can individually make a difference. We can collaboratively make a difference. But the one thing that's common to both of those is the need to make a difference. And, and uh, 
And that's what your show is about as well. Beautiful. Yes. And that is that that is another that, that's exactly exactly what people need to keep in mind. You know, it would be, be nice if those started to come in and more of the um, the way that we brought children up, you know, as opposed to them singing a song like Three Blind Mice, you know, where the, they're about to be killed or whatever. You know, it would be nice to, <laughs> to start to bring that kindness in, you know, um, we I, I'd heard a, a really great I was talking to um, to Peter Egan about this and he was talking about how a lot of the children's nursery rhymes and the things like that are designed to create uh, this selective compassion. And it feels to me that once that selective compassion grows and grows and grows inside of people, we always end up with that uh, that incorrect nature pyramid, like you were talking about, where people mistake themselves as the the, the top of it as opposed to just a, a part of you know yeah. something. Um, if it was this shape, bigger. If this if it was this shape, then I would say that that's not about an evolutionary pyramid. I would say that's a responsibility pyramid. The the the, the species at the top has responsibility for all the species below that position in the pyramid. So it's not about being more evolved. It's about having greater responsibility. And, and we sure do. We, sh we certainly do. I was going to say that it, it, the, the issue of, you know, zoos, Harambe, what happened, the mm -hmm. tragedy and everything else is, um, is, is sort of looks at the status quo. It's like, we have zoos, we have 10,000 zoos, we have millions of animals, we spend billions of dollars, and and will that ever change? And um, I'm going to be hosting on the 29th of November, I'll say it slowly just in case people are scribbling it down. It's, a, it's an in-person event, but it is also a streamed event at the Royal Geographical Society in London. On the 29th of November, I'll be hosting uh, an event called Beyond Zoos, and I think it's going to be fascinating. I have some really great panelists to talk it through, not to argue. This is not an argument. I don't. I will literally ask people to leave if they want to turn it into an argument, because I'm exploring with people what beyond zoos might look like. It, it, as we said at the start of this podcast, if if zoos have set themselves up to have three main functions, with a the fourth one being to entertain people but the three main functions are to conserve species to educate people and to carry out research to support the conservation of species can we do it better what is there beyond zoos that allows us to think differently and act differently to make a real difference and not be trapped in the captive construct that zoos represent. They are, they are a captive construct as much as they are a captive reality. So let's break those barriers and think differently. And uh, you can find details about that on our website. And it's uh, and it, I think it's very cheap. And, and I was gonna say it's free. It's not free, but it's like $12 or something. Yeah. We want that, you know, that is great. Oh. Sorry, I didn't mean to, I didn't mean to interrupt. I'm so excited because that's one of the biggest problems is we're not having enough conversations. The opposing sides sometimes dig in and we need somebody to come in and say let's let's discuss this. Let's let's talk because only through conversations are we going to find solutions to be able even to be able to ask the right questions, to think about solutions for the future. So, you know, it's really exciting that you guys are doing that. Um I'll definitely be there. Uh, let's see. We've got the link right here in the comments for everybody. Um, Sierra, let's put that well up done. for us. Uh, Sierra, thank you, for, thank you so much for doing that. I, uh, we held a, a similar event last year, Eric, called Beyond Trophy Hunting. And I promise mm. you, in two hours, we only mentioned the words trophy hunting twice because we weren't there to go, well, trophy hunters say this, and those opposed to trophy hunting say that. That was not the purpose of the event. It was to say, what's beyond that? What could we do that's different? What could we do that's better, more compassionate, more inclusive, delivers for local communities, delivers for conservation, but not at the point of a gun? And I want to, to try and have, and it'll be a challenge, but I'd love to have a similarly adventurous exploration of beyond zoos 
because I think it's mm -hmm. such a fascinating subject and we're all a bit and the, the the difference between the beyond trophy hunting and beyond zoos is that very very few people have actually participated in trophy hunting mm -hmm. but millions of people in every country have been to the zoo so you they have you have a real life uh experience that you can relate to and maybe you enjoyed it but maybe you had concerns and maybe you would ask that question is there something better we can do? What's beyond zoos? Love the concept too, beyond zoos. Um, you know, and that, that actually brings me back to uh, Harambe. You know, I'm curious what your thoughts are. I mean, it, it, I think it's a fantastic thing because it's a very polarizing story. Um, some people, you know, I, I really see it from different perspectives. With that sort of clashing of, of ideas, I feel like it's a fertile ground for new concepts to, to arise. How do you see, what, what can we do or how, how do you see that we can use Harambe's name and concept of, you know, uh, everybody pulling together for the benefit of all uh, as Harambe, you know, um, and for everybody that that's, doesn't know, that's what Harambe's name literally means, pulling together, sharing, caring, being together. Um, how do you think we can take this event or what can we take from it that can help us all move forward or learn? Gosh, it's, that's a, it's a massive question. Um, the, uh, over, over the course of, the, well, my lifetime, there have been certain animals that have symbolized something. So Elsa, the, the lioness from the Born Free story, and um, the, the tragedy of, of Flipper, not that Flipper was, in a sense, one individual animal, but, you know, Rico Barry's story about the real story of Flipper and the tragedy that lay behind that. And then we have the tragedy of, of Harambe as well. The, the, uh, I think the, the mistake we make is that we often try and apportion blame or try and find the villain of the piece. You know, some people have said it was the zoo. Some people have said it was the, I don't know, safety consultant. Some people have said it was the parents. I, I have, you know, I'm, I understand why they might think that. But I think that that's thinking too small. I think the villain of the piece, if there is one, is the concept. The concept that it is okay to lock up all these animals in alien environments, totally removed from the kind of ecosystem that they would normally have lived in and for which they are designed. I mean, evolution is a design function for an animal to make the best of the environment in which it has evolved to live. There is no such thing in a zoo. There is no evolved environment. There is a man, human-made environment that is as artificial as you can get. And then what we do is we try and mitigate the impact of that environment on the animals by introducing environmental enrichment. I mean, if you have to have environmental enrichment, what does that tell you about the environment in the first place? That it is deprived, that it is non-functional that it is designed around the management needs of human beings as opposed to the behavioral, social, psychological, and physical needs of the animals. So I think the concept is so deeply flawed. And this 200-year experiment that I've mentioned needs to come to an end. Um, and we don't have a great deal of time to do this. Uh, because if we're going to pivot and put the energy and money and resources and human resources and our intelligence and our intellect as the responsible person, the responsible species at the top of that pyramid that we've discussed earlier, then we we have the next decade to do this. If we if we don't crack it, in my view, if we don't crack it in the next decade, reversing that process, going back up the hill, getting back to where we actually know we should be is going to be so hard it will be almost impossible so so now is that moment and we should seize it as a moment of opportunity we shouldn't we shouldn't be like staring at like a rabbit in the headlights of the car that's coming towards it down the road we should be seeing this as an extraordinary opportunity a once not in a lifetime but almost a once in a species opportunity we have spent the last 300 years 400 years forgive me, but screwing up the planet. Now we have a chance because we've reached a moment of realization of self-awareness 
that allows us to go that was that was then we can't undo history what we can do is make a better future